Porn stars embody the sexual ideals of gay men. It is the porn star's sexual performance that is the portal through which viewers engage with a pornographic movie. Director Fred Halstead considered hardcore porn a performer's medium as well as the cameraman's. When filmmaker Fred Halstead was alive, nobody really knew what to make of him. Fred Halstead was in all senses a pornographer, but more an experimentalist who was heavily influenced by a friend and underground filmmaker Kenneth Anger and whose films, unlike many of the erotic gay films that were released in the early days, were rough, dark, and extreme. He went on to make ambitious and experimental films that included some of the first visual examples of fisting and would garner critical acclaim for his work during his lifetime. On tonight's episode, we're going to celebrate Fred Halstead, an unapologetic kinkster whose films polarized audiences and gave viewers a peek into his dark mind and championed the cause of the BDSM community and gay subcultures that were shunned during the early days of pornography. This is Demystifying Gay Porn. My name is Ike Grande, and if you watch gay porn, I've definitely helped to get off. Before we continue, I want to remind you to help this channel by clicking the subscribe button and selecting the bell icon for notifications to see more content like this. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Fred Halstead. The gay movie, in less than five years, has become an art form in American cinema. Let's turn on with some of the best shots in the lot. Fred Charles Halstead was born in Long Beach, California in 1941 to his parents Milton William Halstead, a construction worker with roots in the railroad industry, and his mother Lillian Halstead, an agricultural worker and dukabor. The dukabor, or spirit wrestlers, were a religious sect with origins in Russia hundreds of years ago. Much of the Dukabor group's history is riddled with inaccuracies due to their resistance to put anything in writing, including their own history, relying on oral tradition. Lillian and Milton married in 1936 and had two sons, Milton and Fred. In 1944, Milton would abandon his family. Halstead described his mother as a hustler who struggled to support her children. Lillian would later remarry a fellow Dukabor from her hometown. Halstead's stepfather would make an acceptable husband but an abusive stepfather of Fred. Halstead has gone on to say that he was raped by his stepfather. Halstead recounted his experience to a friend. He would put up a struggle, but ultimately he had to surrender. Halstead described it as a turning point in his identity when he realized he had the power to sexually terrify other men. He really didn't like sex, but he liked the power behind it. Halstead attended school in Bakersfield, California and studied botany at Cal State, becoming a gardener for clients like Joey Heatherton and Vincent Price, a time he considers the happiest of his life. In 1969, Halstead took a break from gardening and began to film porn loops that were shown in East Los Angeles. It is at this point that Halstead decided to make an autobiographical homosexual story. Halstead was not classically taught. He didn't have a regular job. He didn't shoot commercials or videos. He didn't even have a social security number. But what he did have was an eye for L.A. His first film, L.A. Plays Itself, was shot over a period of three years and was almost instantly regarded as a classic in the gay porn genre. When it was released, L.A. Played Itself made Halston the kind of celebrity that doesn't exist today. With his newfound underground fame, Halstead planned on making another film and making it a crossover into mainstream. The two following films would be known as Halstead's L.A. Sex Trilogy. Halston made Sex Garage next, a 35-minute black and white short that was after L.A. plays itself and intended to accompany it at screenings. Shot in a garage in the Hollywood Hills over the span of six hours, Sex Garage mixes an array of visual overtures like Sunset Strip, billboards, money, soap suds on body hair, and water flowing down the drain in a shower. Calendars and girly magazines found in the sort of garage where older generation of mechanics did their work. Sex Garage defied genre conventions as embryonic as they were in the gay porn of 1972, but did so in ways different from L.A. plays itself. The straight sex between the flower children or hippies, often shown in macroscopic detail, casually introduces bisexuality in a gay porn film long before the bisexual genre became fashionable during the early 1990s.
For his next film, Halsted made Sex Tool, exploring a fantasy Los Angeles populated by policemen, boxers, leathermen, a sailor, and one straight man squiring for his Amerasian transgender paramour. I've got a one-hander for you to entertain right here. Again? We've been dancing for hours and hours. Who's keeping score? I fuck you so hard and deep, you shouldn't even be able to walk. At the time, Sex Tool was one of the most explicit films meant for general release. What Halstead ended up presenting was an even more avant-garde piece than the last two offerings, held together by dialogue. Mainstream theaters were not keen on picking up the film. The only other option was the porn circuit, but many of the porn theaters were not equipped to handle a 35mm film. In the end, Sex Tool received limited distribution. To Halstead, the film was sexually political. He establishes visual dialogue between intense BDSM sequences, including some with his lover Joey Yale, and a trans woman, and drag queens at an upscale party. After the Museum of Modern Art screened Halstead's work, they acquired three prints of all three films and lent his work a distinction he seldom forgot. After the commercial failure of Sex Tool, Halstead began to write and started his own magazine, Package, which ran six issues. There, he would revel in self-expression and extreme sexual liberation. Halstead was very schooled in politics and gay sexuality. He was not able to mount another project, as ambitious as Sex Tool again, but he was still a star. Halstead starred in films for other studios and filmmakers, including Eroticus, directed by Tom DeSimone, and Joe Gage's El Paso Wrecking Corps, part of a trilogy of gay films about the proletariat man. In 1979, Halstead, along with his romantic partner and business partner Joey Yale, brought the play News for Tennessee to the stage. Halstead starred as a hustler in the play, which he performed at the Pilot Theater in Los Angeles. It was mildly received. When Halstead returned to directing in the 1980s, many of the films were forgettable, with the exception of A Night at Halstead's, which stood out on its own as a return to form, though he never again made a film with the originality and raw energy of his L.A. Sex Trilogy. A Night at Halstead's was shot at a club Fred Halstead briefly owned with business partner David Webb and Joseph Yale in the early 1980s. Halstead's was a raw industrial space transformed into something Halstead called a stand-up fuck club. Halstead's included a trailer of an 18-wheeler simulating the trucks of New York City's meatpacking district, a plexiglass wall with a glory hole, and a set of bunk beds with no mattresses. The club's life was short-lived, as Halstead would go on to note there weren't enough perverts in Los Angeles to support the business he envisioned. Joey Yale was a frequent collaborator of Halstead's who he met outside of a bar, Falcon's Lair, at 19. He was too young to get into the club at the time, but that meeting would lead to a romantic partnership as well as a business relationship when they opened their studio Costco, under which they released their own titles. Joey Yale and Halstead had a tumultuous relationship and would part ways and sell their films to his video in 1984. Around this time, Joey became sick with AIDS and would pass away in 1986. Halstead was an emotional wreck following Joey Yale's death. He was without an anchor and drowned himself in alcohol. He was also financially destitute. He was losing his struggle to alcohol and drugs. He received help from his brother, who allowed him to stay at an apartment he owned in Orange County in exchange for maintenance and gardening work. On May 9, 1989, at the age of 47, Fred Halstead would take his own life by overdosing on sleeping pills in that same apartment. His suicide note would read, I wanted to be with Joey. I am a has-been, and now I can't get anything produced. I am broke, and can't get a job in my field. My skin is fouled up. I've had a good life. I've had looks, a body, money, success, and artistic triumphs. I've had the love of my life. I see no reason to go on. Is anybody coming? Doing? Turn around. I'll take down my pants. Hurry up really quick. Fast, fast. No cars. All right. Oh, Jesus. You're not going to put this in the film. Fire the editor. If you put this in the film, I'm going to sue.
At the end of his life, Halstead wrote an autobiography called Why I Did It. He intended to have it published, but a porn publisher named George Mavady rejected it saying it was unpublishable. Halstead's hopes were dashed. The only copy of the book was never seen again, but is supposedly in the hands of one of his close friends. We may never really know why he did it, why Fred Halstead would pursue a career in gay porn. During his lifetime, an openly gay filmmaker had no hope of making gay films in the industry. Being free enough to make sex films seemed not only possible, but necessary. Fred Halstead refused to engage in any rules of the game. Halstead took advantage of a window of opportunity that would inevitably leave him behind. As porn became the juggernaut it is today, it lost all of its creativity and personality for safe and formulaic. You can still find Halstead's work online, but most of his films have fallen out of distribution. However, Fred Halstead does have the distinct honor of having his L.A. Sex Trilogy be the only gay pornographic movies in the permanent collection at the Museum of Modern Art. Fun fact. L.A. Plays Itself divided viewers and critics upon its release due to its non-narrative storyline as well as its far-out visuals. It was so wild at that time that surrealist painter Salvatore Dali attended the screening and was quoted as saying, New information for me. You've been watching Demystifying Gay Porn. I am your host, Ike Grande. Demystifying Gay Porn can be found on every podcast directory as well as YouTube. Demystifying Gay Porn is on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Telegram, Discord. And if you like what you're watching and want to be a part of the process, head over to patreon.com backslash demystifying gay porn where you can help support this channel and I can continue making content like this. Once again, this is Demystifying Gay Porn. My name is Ike Grande, and if you watch gay porn, I've definitely helped to get off. Cheers. Thank you.